Eddie Cone, Ron. Hey. It is Cone, isn't it? He, it is. Of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. What else are you going to call me? Oh, mate, don't. <laughs> I had a, I had a, I, 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 I interviewed someone before, and his, his first name is spelled A L E X S. I said, Alexis, pleasure to have you on. He says, just oh, Alex. 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 Alex with an S. <laughs> right. Um, we were talking before we start recording. You were going to explain lighthouse mm. theory to me. Then, in classic Hugh Kia fashion, you went completely off on a tangent and didn't explain lighthouse <laughs> theory to me. Talk to me, Goose. Yeah. So, lighthouse theory is something that, that I came up with. I've. I've been around the uh, sports industry for many, many years, mentoring um, elite athletes now, um, all the way down to people that want to get into the sport. Um, and that mentoring or coaching isn't just on the fighting tip that goes into their life. Um, so people come into the gym, leave the gym, go away for a while, a couple of years, 10 years even, as a, a case happened recently. Um, and then out of the blue, they give me a call and we talk about life. We talk about where they're at in their life, the problems they're having. And the lighthouse theory is that I always refer to them as when they're in their darkest hour. Right in the distance, there's a small little light and they can always make their way home. I'll always be there for them to support them and, and help them the best way I can. Whether it's business, whether it's just, just a chat or whether it's um, training. They want to get back on the, on the rails and start going again. Yeah, it's one of the. I think it's reaching out, and connecting when Absolutely. when you don't when you don't want it. It's just like a light at the end of the tunnel. Like mm. being, and, yeah, I think that was um, that was probably the most the single mo most important thing that I found most difficult to do was when I was in a real bad way was to speak to people and the people who don't come back from those mm. kind of depths are uh, they don't reach out and it's, I understand why. Why do you think that is? From my own experience, um, because when I was at my worst, uh, I this this one on my you've this, turned this already. Hold around. On, this, this you've one, turned this round already. <laughs> this one, I can't believe you did that to me, Hugh. This is classic here. Did you see the defensive pose you just took then? Well, <laughs> outrageous. Anyway, I'm going to switch back to being the interview in a minute, Eddie. Jesus Go on, Christ. I'm just interested. <laughs> Classic I'm, interrogation I'm just, tactic. I'm just interested, mate. That's all. Uh, because when, so for me, when I was when I was at my worst, um, I I probably felt a combination of shame, uh, embarrassment. Uh, I felt like um, there was nothing respectful around me about me. I was of no use to anyone. I was in. I was. I was in. A, uh, what's the word? I was. I was. I just caused people problems. Uh, it's better off not being in the knot, and that was one thing in, in terms of the reaching out to people. If I was to if I was to go, ah, I'm going to ring my lighthouse guy, my beacon guy, Eddie, I wouldn't want to do it because in 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 speaking to you, or it wasn't you at the time, it was uh, a guy called Luke Luke Hardy, and um, to speak to him meant that I had to address what I was feeling. Mm. Not that he would ask me about it because he was. He knew not to, but he knew that just being on the end of the phone was good enough. But it meant I would have to. So I would have an to exposure address of vulnerability, weakness, etc., etc. Things that I don't know what your experience would have met, but things that with the military, um, especially infantry, especially power range, I think we are conditioned, and rightly so, we are conditioned to not want to uh, expose. To anyone, our mm. subordinates exposed to anyone that there, we have weaknesses, or we're not the ultimate human being. Because I need, I was a leader. I need to lead people, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and so to, to 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 then try and recondition yourself to be in touch, more emotionally intelligent, more emotionally aware. Oh, it's not comfortable at all. It's not a comfortable situation at all. I think that men have been programmed or groomed from day one to be hard asses to be um, the weight carriers, the breadwinners, all of that stuff that goes with uh, masculinity from the day of day dot, from the day of dawn. And for any man to put that down, put them bags down, take that weight off them and go, actually, I'm not feeling good today. I'm feeling bad today. I'm feeling suicidal today. I'm feeling upset today. It takes a lot. You know, it takes a lot to shed that skin, especially in your background. Um, I can talk about my background, but my background's not your background. Two totally different people doing a totally different job, although they do have similar 
Um, there are some parallel concepts there. Um, the what you summed up was was absolutely right. As I said to you just before we we got here, I had a conversation in the car on the way up here with someone who is at that point, who is at that point, and they needed to be told some truths. And it's better to tell the truth with love than to tell the truth from a place of dishonesty or, or deceit. And I could have easily, I could, he, it's a victim mentality with that situation. And where you find, and I'll tell you why, I've removed from my vocabulary the words but and because. I've done that just as a course. Um, I don't believe in buts or because. I believe in owning what we do, every single detail, every single thing that we do, every single choice we make is down to us. I didn't do it because they made me do it. I didn't do it because that happened. I did it because I wanted to do it. I'm in charge and I'm in control of that. And once we understand that from a, a real place, not a place of like, um, not, a, not really a self-ownership place, but from a place of like deep understanding inside, you suddenly, I felt, I feel regenerate rejuvenated with that that I can actually say listen I did that and I did it because of this not because of that I did it because of the choices I made not because I was told to or, or any other reason um, and where you find that victim mentality that's what I label it as where you have family members and friends and other people saying oh yeah poor you yeah you did that because of this and yeah we get that you'll find they're all victims they all flock together they all live and they harbor that victim mentality and the moment you step out of that and look back, listen, I was a victim my, half my life. Who doesn't want that, that comfort cushion and all the rest of it? But there is a point where you have to go, this is on me. And all these choices and these decisions are because of me. And once you understand that, man, it's so different. It's beautiful over here now. It's not the same. It's not what it was. Um, and I look at people and I go, man, that is just victim energy. You know, that really is. But yeah, you get the vic you got the victim energy <coughs> side of it, which is, and, but also that demonstrates the same sort of behaviours, the same patterns. Is something that I would I wouldn't describe as the victim mentality, but I'd, I'd probably describe it, describe it as the flipping woke mentality at the moment. In that, exactly the same thing: an unwillingness to accept blame or accountability for something. Absolutely. And I see it in the younger generations, definitely. At the moment, I've got two young daughters, mm. and I see it occasionally there. And when, it's, when you uh, say it's the, always a reason for something else. Of course, of course, because it's a blame society. It's a blame society. It's never my fault. Excuse me. It's never my fault. You know, it's always the fault of another body or another agency or another person or another thing. You know, no one said to you, hey, Hugh, don't get up today and come in and do this podcast. Stay at home and play PlayStation. If you play PlayStation, right? Xbox, man. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just stating a point. But I am super tough on myself. I'm super tough on my, my kids. I'm super tough on those around me in the sense of that energy just sucks, saturate, you know, it just pulls the life out of me. Now, when we go back to people that, that are in that mindset of what we were talking about, where they feel suicidal, they feel this, they feel that, sometimes that's not their fault. There are other factors around that. But when you drill into that, when you like the conversation I had today was, um, yeah, I'm on, I'm, I'm drinking a lot. And I said, listen, the alcohol doesn't pick itself up, unscrew the cap, pour it into the glass, the glass lifts and you drink it yourself. Now, that's a conscious choice. There's a single denominating factor with all this madness and destruction that's going on around you. And I'm talking to that single denominating factor right now. And I heard the penny drop. I heard the penny drop, right? So so that's where I, that's that's what I'm I'm talking about with, with that scenario. Now I'm not saying there isn't situations where there are people that are in those situations because they have nowhere to turn. But me personally, I'm providing a single place of benefit. I'm three quarters of the way through my life at the moment. People don't really realize how old I am. It's top secret information, G14 classified, right? But I've lived the life of a 99 year old in the years of the age that I am now. Um, and I just seem to attract these energies and it just is what it is. You know, I take that, I relish that all day. Voice of reason and speaking sensibly is what that is. How, how did you, how did you come to learn to come to pull that uh, 
de- you know, delete but and because from your vocabulary. Why, what led to that mm. conscious decision for you to start living? Because obviously that's just two practical examples, but you, you obviously changed the way you live it. Yeah, for sure. What, what led to that? Um, I just think it was experiences that I'd been through. I, you know, I, I can't pinpoint it exactly, exactly what it was. But what I can tell you is I was, listen, growing up, I was an arsehole, you know. I was a, I was a dick when I was younger. Um, and anyone who knew me then that I'd ever been a dick or an arsehole to, let me apologize to now because, you know, that's legit. You know, if, if you knew me when I was growing up, what an idiot. But I had to go through that to figure out who I am now. And I think some of the changing points were from the Met, some incidents within the Met, some incidents from influences in my own life and I think I've always strived to be better and not be the same someone said to me the other day oh you know you're not the same this was on Instagram you're not the same person that I knew 10 years ago you're damn right I'm not I'm not the same person I was yesterday (laughs) if you knew me yesterday and you know me today I'm not the same person and uh, but that's growth that's my own choice that's my own growth if you go over my pictures on Instagram um, or what information is there you won't see me with a group of people you just don't see me. You see me with a, a group of training partners, but I'm always solo. I'm always flying on my own. You know, it's, I work better that way. It's a better principle for me. I'm not going to offend nobody with honesty. I'm not going to shatter nobody's, you know, victim mentality. I'm not going to shatter nobody's dreams by, by being me. Um, I, I just, it's just that, uh, Hugh. I can't pinpoint anything. It's just life experiences. Multitude of them. Are you nervous about? Are you nervous about publishing your backstory? Are you nervous about the book? I'm not nervous. Is? I know some people that are. <laughs> <laughs> um, am I nervous? No, because it's uh, it's looking through a window into my perspective and my life and my journey. It's not anyone else's journey. This isn't his history. If we break that in half, it's his story. This is mystery, my story, right? So it isn't. It isn't. I don't care who who really, oh, you know, they can't relate to that. Fine, you've never been through that. I can't relate to some of the stuff you've been through. Um, so I'm not nervous about publishing it. It's a complete kind of um, insight to me, what makes me tick, how I operate, how I work, uh, experiences that I've been through. Um, and there's been some very dark ones and there's some r- really good ones, you know, really good experiences. And I'm not afraid to to kind of put them out there and talk about them. I know some people that are, but um, but I'm not. You know, it's a complete kind. And I think you get to that point in life where you're like, man, this is who I am, and 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 take it or leave it. You know, if, if you're with it, you're with it. If it resonates with you, it does. If it doesn't, let's keep it moving. Are you finding the process enjoyable of putting that stuff on paper? I'm finding it. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a release for me. Stuff I've wanted to say for years that I've bottled up. That I couldn't get out. That I listen. Not that I couldn't get out. That I that didn't make me feel vulnerable. That didn't make me feel. You know, I had to keep this staunch mentality because people that know me will say, "Oh, yeah, that guy's this and that." If you really know me, I'm a quite a gentle soul. I'm a quiet person who likes my own company. But for me to come out and say that five years ago, ten years ago, you would never get me saying that. You know, you would never. There were times when I'd leave shift. Uh, in the Met after dealing with some of the most horrendous things and go home, turn the lights off in the dark and lick my wounds and cry. And no one would know that. No one would ever see that because we we were never show we were never told to show that emotion. You know, there are certain things that I can now talk about which is a healing process. This is part of my healing process, you know. And I understand that now. I didn't understand it then. Um and, and the theory is that When you work in a job like we both have, different spectrums, but similar sort of attitudes, they keep taking from the well. And eventually the well will run out of water or we're not able to carry the buckets anymore. That's eventually what happens. Um, And I was at that point. And I recognized that point, you know. Um, And 10 years later, close to 10 years of me now being out, where a lot has changed and people have changed and the way they do things has changed, I still look back in and go, you guys are dinosaurs. Like, you haven't learned anything, really. You know, and and I'm talking about the Met here. The Met is the same 
group of people that get accused of something and don't fight it, they will settle out of court. They don't fight it, you know. That is the, one of the worst and most frustrating things for me, especially when you know you're in the right, you know. And, and you're going to ask me, oh, why do you think that is? I have no idea, but that needs to change. Right? I have no idea why they do that. If you take the Met to court, for, you know, we can see this, and history dictates that. We can go back and look at that. When they have been taken to court for something which we know is like from the inside, that's, that never happened, that's not true. They settle out of court because they don't want bad press. How can you give bad press to someone that already has bad press anyway? <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's probably a combination of that bad press thing, but also it's, I, I'd suggest it's less resource intent, intensive to settle out of court than it is to go through the whole court, court process. In terms, resource in terms of... Taxpayers' money. Time, money... Yeah, I don't know. But you're right, because the thing is, is that uh, setting out a court for an onlooker, a layman... What does that say? It, it's an indication it's of guilt, guilt to them. Right. When it isn't... All, I, I understand what you're saying. It's not always the case. Go back to... Mate, you talking about... I will stop. You mentioned something before the podcast, and it's some, it's 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 a, a perception of, uh, of... of what your... What's the word... Uh, your frequency of uh, your frequency of traumatic events. I'll, I'll I'll describe it as a frequency of high intensity, high pressure events, and how often you have to do them. Met police and talking about police in general, mm -hmm. right? How to do them on a daily basis, and it's a it's something that I've only just I've only recently realised. It doesn't it's not just with the police, it's with other other things. Paramedic, for example, absolutely. And the other one I got I got I learned about it from is in terms of differences to the way I experience stuff was uh, a thing called the MERT, Medical Evacuation Response Team, mm -hmm. which you mentioned, we were talking about mm -hmm. Ross Moy, Dr. Ross Moy, he was yep. a doctor in the MERT, I had another guy on his ex RF regiment, and he spent a lot of time in the MERT. And, and Tom Martinson, a real, suffers with PTSD now, um, but he's, he's, he's got a, he deals with it well. And he was saying, like, when you're on the moot and you're going into something, and it's, this is what resonates with what you were talking about and what Dr. Ross Moy was talking about, and my mate who's a paramedic, Luke Hardy, in fact, is a paramedic okay. in London, what he was talking about is that when you get called out, you're going into someone's worst day. When, yep. when you go, it's someone's worst day. Mm -hmm. every, every time, bar none, someone is having a nightmare of it, and you're going in there to try and... And what do they want from that? They want resolution. They yeah, want exactly. answers. They want everything. <clears throat> and so that kind of repeated high highly stressful highly stressful environments you're going into on a repeated daily basis mm. whereas i never experienced that it was there was times where come on man you're playing no, it down. no i'm, no, I'm not no i'm serious so there's no i could go you know there was times where mm. you'd have a lot of stuff going on in the day mm. three four five six mm -hmm. uh Firefights in the commas in a day, yeah. contacts, we got contacts in a day, right? Um, and so there wouldn't, wouldn't be anything, right? All relatively stressful, but not every time was a flipping nightmare. And it was for, you know, four or five months at a time, I think the longest, so it was five months, you know, without, without a brick. But not every day, non stop. Mm. Uh, like you were saying, you do what, five day, five? Seven on, two off, seven on. Um, when I was there, seven on, two off, quick changeover. No, sorry, seven off, on. So that could be seven days. Then you do either a quick changeover, which means you're out and back in for the next day, two till 10 late turn paper day. And then it would be five off, seven back on, uh, two days off, depending on deployment, depending on what was happening proactively on that, that group, depending on what group you belong to. Um, that high, Working in that highest stress level, when I joined the Met, I joined one of the busiest borrowers in the Met. Unbeknownst to me, it was that busy. And I would turn up to shift on the early car, and there would be something like 27 outstanding I calls. I calls are immediate response calls. So there would be an early car, we would turn up, and remember, I'm talking for your listeners, I'm talking 10 years ago, that may have changed by now. I don't know what their protocols are. But I would turn up, there'd be an uh, early car, we would jump into the early car, and off we'd go straight away, blue lights and two tones. Now, the neurological side of, of that starts earlier on in the day it doesn't start that day when you arrive at the job so what happens is during your day you suddenly go oh i'm on i'm on i'm on the area car tonight and there's six weeks postings back then i'm on the area car tonight a lot of things come into play so i'm thinking about the i'm thinking about the driver if i'm the operator and he's the driver i'm thinking about who's the driver 
oh, it's that guy. I know he has a ten. I'm very meticulous in the way I am. I know he has a tendency to carry his packed lunch in the front footwell. I've got to be careful, even me, that that doesn't slide under the accelerator or the brake when we're on an eye call and something bad happens. So during our conversation, I have to get that sandwich box and move that packed lunch box for my own safety without letting him know. I also have to be aware of how he likes me to operate the RT equipment, how he, how he, how he likes me to operate the radio transmissions, how, as an observer, I'm able to get him from A to B, because before the MDT came in, it was all maps, A to Z. MDT? Uh, it's the Metropolitan Police's where they dispatch the call, I can't remember what it stands for, into the car on a digital box, met digital transmissions or something. And then you no longer needed the A to Z, it's right there on the screen. So you turn up and throughout that day you would go, right, so I'm working with this guy, he likes things done this way, I don't want to piss him off, because if you piss him off, that's going to be a shitty six weeks. And so on and so forth. So throughout the day I'm thinking, right, got to get in early now driving as soon as I'm driving there now I'm in cop mode you know you go from being normal person mode to cop mode so those neurological factors start to play in when you get in the car you sort or before you get in the car you're doing all your safety checks on the vehicle you're doing the safety checks of your equipment you're making sure that your CS sprays to hand your tasers to hand your ASP to hand your first aid kit is in the back of that vehicle anything that you may need is in that vehicle now me being me I was very meticulous with that I don't know if that's OHD because it's still apparent today, but OHD and all of that stuff, ADHD or whatever it is. OCD. OCD, that's it, OHD. Um, OCD, yeah. So I'm very, very on point because I've had people die when I've been there. And that is a shit feeling. You know, that is, that that will wreck you, you know. So all of, all of those checks I'm doing in my head and then I'm tangibly feeling that when I get there. We get into the vehicle straight away. MDT pings up, I call, this has happened, let's go here. As I said to you earlier, we have to be at every situation all of the time. 30 seconds late results in a suspect getting away, someone being seriously injured or worse, or we're turning up to a crime scene of, a, of now a, a murder or worse, sexual assault, whatever it is. No one ever, I've said this on every single podcast, no one ever picks up the phone and says, Hi, Met Police. Just wanted to let you know you're doing an incredible job. We love you guys. You know, power to the blue and put the phone down. No, they call us when it goes bad. When shit's hit the fan and covered everyone, as a last resort, we get called. You know? So we get called when the wheels come off. In my whole 19 years experience in the Met, I come, came across two incidents unfolding. That's how rare it is to come across a crime in progress. We're usually called. We don't usually drive and find something. Uh, you know, you might catch someone ah, breaking right. into a car. You might find something. But I'm talking about a street robbery in progress, an armed robbery in progress, uh, you know, someone breaking into someone's house. Highly unlikely, you know. So, um, so yeah, those stress levels are incredible, you know. Um, and what is the coping mechanism? Well, we're all different. We're all programmed different, you know. Um, I know people that would just turn up for work. It was a job for them. They would get in the car, think about their paycheck at the end of the month, bimble around, never really doing nothing, you know. Yes, they would go to the calls and they would deal with it, but that wasn't their priority. And I'd look at them and think, why are you guys not stressed out? Like, right. I am stressed, you know. Like, fuck, I'm like, I'm ready to go nuts over here, you know. And, and the mental draining, two, three in the morning, when you'd be on a night shift, and you'd be driving around and I'd be nodding off sometimes, not because I'm tired, but the mental fatigue is just set in. The worst thing about that whole thing was there was very few resources within the Metropolitan Police to support you. You really had to go through something to get support and the support you got to me, this is my interpretation of it, it's not the Mets or anyone else, it's my own. It was an ass covering exercise when they sent you to be medically assessed. It was just to cover them. So if you topped yourself or something bad happened, if you were an alcoholic or whatever, um, that they could say, we'd sent you to be psychologically evaluated or we'd sent you to do this or that. It was an ass covering exercise. There wasn't ever anything in there that was like solid, you know. There was a question. One of our, one of our patrons has a question. I'll ask you later on about that, actually, about mental health support within the Met. But um, those people who 
who can just deal with or don't get don't seem to get affected by stuff. The people who are just normal, not the people who like disassociate and have zero emotions. That's what, that was me. That was me for a long time. I thought, ah, man, I just, I just really good in stuff like that, and I don't have any emotions. And I was, and then recently, last year, actually, I was talking to a uh, a psychotherapist, and she's like, no, disassociation is not good. No, no, because no, it pops up. It has a, it has a, a rare thing of like you'd be sitting somewhere and suddenly it will just pop up like, hey, I'm so and so from a hundred years ago. And you're like, oh, shit. like, where did you come from? Yeah, exactly. But those people, I don't, I don't understand. They, I don't understand how they exist like that. So they just, they, do, they are a very special breed. I don't know if that's a positive or a negative thing. But um, uh, what was? How did you deal with it? How did you deal with that stress? I mean, you you mentioned you know getting in off a shift. I, I take it for your two your, your two days off and just you know being in 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 tatters in in your place. Um, can we talk about that. Yeah, so was that. In those situations, was it a, was it something that you could consciously uh, pinpoint as being the cause, or was it again just a, a general uh, result of the distress coming coming down from the job? I think, for me, growing up and going through trauma upon trauma as a youngster, trauma, 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 and carrying that trauma, not having an outlet for that trauma, it was normal for me. I would take it on board and kind of just put it in the backpack. Oh, it's it's just normal. It's just normal. And and I would deal with it in different ways. And one of the ways that I realized that it was materializing, it was becoming a tangible thing, was gratuitous violence in the gyms. I would get into gym wars in the gym. So I'd go to the gym, boxing, tie boxing, whatever it was. And I'd really go to town with other people. We would really go at it. And then when I'd sit and talk to these people after, and they'd go, yeah, I'm a fireman. And you know, they, and then I started realizing very quickly, Jesus, there's a, there's a cycle here. Look at the people I'm training with. Just a little bit of information on what they're about. And it's the same thing. And we would, there'd be gym wars. And that would be the outlet for me. And then I'd feel good for a little while. I'd never speak about it. Like I said, I was... I harboured a lot of information, you know, I harboured a lot of feelings. I'm not a very feeling person. Um, even now I find it hard to express feelings. Um, a classic is go through Instagram pictures and find one of me smiling. <laughs> That's a classic. I have no pictures of, well, very few. And when I see it, I'm like, why was I smiling in that picture? You know, the common joke is everyone smile. Oh, Ed, you're smiling. <laughs> Not you, Ed, you are smiling. It's a straight face. But I didn't have a coping mechanism. I think the coping mechanism was violence. I think it was being in the gym and just knocking the hell out of each other. That's what I think it was. And I'm not good at many things. I'm good at, at violence, you know, inside the gym. I'm good at, you know, at, at really focusing on that. And I think that was a real training uh, changing point for me i think that's how it manifested itself um now not so much you know but i think that was the way that i coped early on how young was that the that violence become an outlet where did it come from what was what was i think about the childhood i think there's a few questions in there yeah there Take is there is no, no 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 problem so so listen the beginning is always a good point if you want to understand where someone's come from or where they're going the beginning is a good point um, I come from the cliche East London family, broken background. Um, I was homeless for close to two years in London. Um, I was abused as a child physically by a stepfather, not sexually, but I was beaten up, had a broken arm for two weeks. Um, various children's homes. It's a kind of cliche run of the mill story. I also found myself in prison before I joined the police for something which was a quick turnaround point for me that made me realize I'm not cut out to be a criminal. And if I'm not going to be a criminal, I might as well be a cop. Um, so, uh, yeah, funny, but, but true. Um, so yeah, violence started very, I don't remember a point in my life when there wasn't violence. I can't remember that point, um, whether it was emotional violence or physical violence. Um, I can remember growing up and thinking to myself, I'm a leader here. These people ain't on my level when it comes to punch ups in the street, whether it comes, I always wanted to be the guy who would go one step further. I always wanted to be that person who, you know, I can remember going to Mile End Park where a friend of ours had got robbed and um, we showed up 
a mob of us, we were like, right, we're going to go to the park and sort these geezers out. They've robbed loads of people over there now. And I remember getting a baseball bat and wrapping barbed wire around it. That's the levels of stupidity that I was involved in as a child. And I remember one of the older lots saying, hold on a minute, we only want to teach them a lesson, not kill no one. How old were you then? Probably about 13. You know, crazy times. Yeah, crazy times. But that was pent-up trauma manifesting itself from where I'd come from. Um, so, so yeah, mum was never around. Dad wasn't on scene. Mum had multiple partners. Um, real, real traumatic kind of life. Lived with my gran. My grandmother passed away when I was 13. I went off the rails at that point. Um, didn't want to be with mum because of the abuse with stepdad and ended up being taken into care um, into uh, a children's home called Hannah Long House, which was based in East London, Cable Street, uh, uh, Wapping, sorry, opposite Tobacco Dock. I used to abscond from there over the war, you know, I'd be out over the war, it was a low, low lockdown one and made myself homeless. I wasn't thrown into the street, but I made myself, I couldn't go back there. And I ended up um, living in a abandoned, it was like derelict site near Tobacco Dock where gas sniffers were prolific. Glue sniffers and gas takers were prolific. It was prolifically happening. Now those people then, I was smart enough not to get involved with that, that stuff. Um, but they were using because of trauma. When I thought back many years and looked at it, but I never ever dabbled in drugs or, or even alcohol. The way that I used to get rid of my feelings were through violence. So I'd always, it would always be a confrontation. Now later in my life, I'd always have confrontations with people. Like friends, I just, we'd have confrontations. And guess what the single denominating factor was? He's sitting right in front of you. <laughs> so I started to, it started to click. It started to, to understand. Um, no real qualifications in school. Everything was self kind of taught and um, worked a couple of dead, dead end jobs. Had one really influential person in my life. Uh, shout out to Mr. Jerry McGrath. I don't know if he's still around, but very, very influential person in my life. Um, entrepreneur uh, guy. Made a lot of money through Whitbread sign, sign writing factories and all the rest of it. Taught me a skill and a, and a, and a, and a, and a graft, if you like. And then from that point on, I can remember thinking to myself, this is going to go two ways. There was a, a guy, a group of people that I know, that, that I knew back then, who were out robbing um, SO stations, holding them up, sticking them up. Thank God I found my niche in life. Otherwise, I would have probably been doing that. And that's not cliche, that's real. You know, that's from a real sincere place. And I just chose the right path at the right time. The universe opened up to me and made me see something. Um, and I started to follow that path. Um, and then I had a lot of experience in between, lived in the US, Brazil, um, and then, yeah, joined the Met, never looked back um, until 19 years later when I just woke up one day and thought, what a journey, what was that, you know? Um, and then ended up on the Hugh podcast. <laughs> The next day, <laughs> ten years later. So, you, America and Brazil. So, you was, you started the Jets before mm -hmm. the Met. Then. Mm -hmm. Ah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I thought ninety four. Jesus Christ, early on, really early on. You expect the wave coming? That came. I didn't at the time. Do you know what happened? I was working in a in a in a box company, and a guy that was working in there brings in an old VHS and goes, "You got to see that. You like violence. You got to see this." Get your eyes around this. I took it home, put the old beater max tape in, grainy thing, and saw <clears throat> Hoyas coming out and just beating everyone up and thought, I reckon I could do that. Three weeks later, left for Brazil. Got there and realized Hoyas doesn't train there anymore. He's in Torrance, California, which was classic material, but ended up meeting his brother, Hoyler, who is now my instructor. Um, and was fortunate enough to train with their father and some of the other greats that have been over there. So, um, so yeah, really good start to jiu-jitsu. And that was a calming down point for me. I really found a calming energy in that. Why is that? What was different about it? Because uh, you talked about violence as an outlet mm. and you've been talking about it in a negative way, as in it's not a good thing. 
And now we're talking about violence, violence. in a positive <laughs> way. Yeah, let me, let me tell you why. It's really hard for someone to be mad at you when you strangle them with a smile on your face. <laughs> as sadistic as that sounds. Elio used to talk and say, listen, don't get blood out of no one. You know, put them on their back, let them roll over, choke <clears> them out, let them submit. And I can remember Hoy saying to his dad, what are you talking about? All of your fights, people ended up in the hospital with their nose across their face. And why are you telling us to be gentle? And, and that just showed the, the, where they started to where I started, how he had changed his life too. And so now I use violence, as, you call, as, as people see it, or jujitsu as a tool for trauma victims to come in. And I look at them and I can just see pain. I just look at people. I, I, look, I don't even look at them. I look into them. I'm looking right through them. I can see it. Anyone I've interviewed in a police custody, barring a few people, it's trauma. The whole thing is trauma. And I think if you come from a place of, of love, I teach jiu-jitsu with love and compassion and, and, and joy and learning. If you teach it and it starts from a place in love, guess where it ends? As pink and fluffy as that sounds, guess where it ends? It ends in love. But if you teach it, in violence and with negativity and with bad intention guess where it ends in that same place and so that's how that's why when i talk about that side of violence i talk about in a different i'll talk about with a smile on my face when i talk about the trauma violence there's no smile in there, there there's only darkness and and destruction that lives there nothing good comes out of that and i'm proof of that yeah i mean i've never referred to jiu-jitsu as it a Brazilian jiu-jitsu say with as violence before like that. It, it, and I think I did it there just to bring it back to what you're saying before and um, but t people do have a mis misconception of it but it, it is a different sport uh, and I think because of when you when you're starting out I, I mean in terms of the benefit from a mental health perspective because mm. it's not about adrenaline going straight to the roof sharp explosive not early on no. sharp explosive well movements. it is it, it is early on and it is because people don't know what they're dealing with you know for example i'm not the biggest guy by a guy in the room i mean i'm taller than you i'm six four i don't know how tall you are six one six four <laughs> but um but no i would always be the guy that would people would come in and go brand new students would go i'm going to train with that guy because he's little unbeknownst to them you know he's little but he's he's violent so there would be all kinds of gym wars that go on you know and the brazilians would laugh they would go oh yeah go train with the, the gringo go train with the english guy like he doesn't know a lot and i'm known to them i've been taking private lessons you know with, with the guys and they would get tied up in knots and it would kind of be when they would come into the academy there were very few english speakers in brazil at that time so i was learning classes that were taught in portuguese and there was a lot of Americans coming in because the UFC had exploded and I would have to talk to them. But when they're coming in, they're violent, their movement is erratic. If you're going to train with a white belt in Jiu Jitsu, a first timer, man, you expect to be accidentally hit, kicked, you know, because they're going to move in ways that you're not expecting. Now, you, you refer to it as a sport. I don't. I don't teach a sport. I don't teach points. I don't teach limitations in my academy. Our jiu-jitsu is in its original format, as taught by Grandmaster Elio Gracie and his sons. It's a self-defense art. I believe it's the most potent style of self-defense the world has ever seen. I honestly believe that wholeheartedly. And I believe military, law enforcement, emergency services, it should be in their curriculum, not the sport. The last place you want to be in a street fight is on your back on the ground. If you understand Gracie Jiu Jitsu, which is what we advocate and what we teach, it has five components. It has striking, clinching, takedowns, throwing, and finally ground grappling. And around all of that it has a mindset. And then there's a weapons defensive program and there's law enforcement programs. It's a complete package. The sport and taking nothing away from it, it's incredible. It's amazing. I love watching it. But it is a sport. And people get let down. By, or they're, they're misinformed about the two. Yeah. The, um, it's the 
Red Mist is not your friend when you in it. That's what's different about it. I think Red Mist is not your friend no. at all. You you got to keep a level head, and you need to understand how to con- control your temper. How, how control do you control that? How do you control that Red Mist? Because we get it at some point, right? We all have it. Well, Red Mist is a loss of control, right? Mm. Red Mist is a loss of control, and I think. Anything where you lose where you lose emotional control in whatever situation, that is down to a misunderstanding of the situation you're going into, and a misunderstanding of how to get out of the situation, and a misunderstanding of the tools at your disposal to deal with a highly stressful situation. Exactly like you taught the police. Exactly like we were taught in the military. Is that if you? It's the same reason. If you were to take the average person off the street now and drop them into the job you used to do. Okay, into a car, react into a, a, a situation. They get out of the car. They they be like they would never fucking clue what to do. They have a meltdown, and it's not because they're any less of a human being than what not you were. Exactly, it's yeah. because they aren't trained to deal with it. They don't understand the situation. So on that point, that training. You know that quote, right? We don't rise to the level of our ability. We fall to the level of our training. Is that right? Is there some quote that says that? I've I'm never heard really... of that. But if you yeah. butcher it now, it becomes yours. Go on. What was yeah, it? Something like that. I'm not saying it again because <laughs> I did a really terrible job of it. But <laughs> it was it's something like that. And training in the Met, as I, I, and we're just talking on that point, isn't consistent. It's not a consistent thing. It's more learning on the job than it is training. I don't know if that is in the military. For example, for example, when you do a driving course in the Met, they do a refresher course, or they did a refresher course once a year. Do you know how much? See, practice doesn't make um, perfect. There's perf- perfection is not attainable. Practice makes permanent. So if you're practicing something incorrect permanently, 21 days to make a habit, 21 days to break a habit, or 90 days, however you feel, whatever it is. If you practice something incorrectly, consistently, guess what you're going to do when the red mist comes? You're going to get it wrong. So there's massive, 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 massive holes when it comes to the Mets training programs. The money that's being invested into training programs should be invested also into the mental health and well-being so that the officers can perform at peak levels all of the time, before, during, and after stressful situations, right? Yeah. So the training of once a year facilitates that officer or said officers to make mistakes, and when they make mistakes, they're punished by the same organization that doesn't provide adequate training for them. Not only does it not provide adequate training for them, they then have an out when they say, we have provided you training because you've signed on the dotted line. Here's our ask covered certificate to say that you have received that training. The next part of the training is only a refresher course. There is nothing there. And I witnessed that myself firsthand. There was nothing in the, in the, in the, in the sphere of that's trauma. They deal with trauma on a daily basis, on a moment by moment basis. We're going to send you to Empress State Building. You were going to see this person. This person has seen many others in that day. And you go in there and it's an arse covering exercise. Right? So there's nothing there for you. It's self learn It's a self learn job. Yes, there's exams. Yes, you have to go through certain things and all the rest of it. But it's completely when you mess up, that is on you. When, when I messed up and I did mess up in the Met, guess where the buck fell? On me. Because they would bring my file out, go, when did you last have your training? Oh, you had it on that day. Okay, had your refresher. So why did you do that? God damn, I'm human. That's how that happened. Like, you, you know, it's, it's a crazy scenario. And only when you're out of, of it do you realize exactly what it is. What should the model be? How, how would you change things? How would I change it? I think the money invested in equipment, which is necessary, we've got equipment, which is military based equipment going into the Met now. We then have training in the Met for that equipment, that equipment and that money needs to be uh, that money needs to be invested into the well being. If I could optimize someone's stuff, if I came to you and said, you're the commissioner of the Met, I've got this great program, whatever the program is, and this program will be to make sure that your officers are fit and well every day. 365 days a year. 
they're going to attend and they're going to be in peak performance, optimal performance. And here's my, my project. And the project would be, you know, constant updates and reviews of that officer. If they have a situation where, where we're not taking care of each other, where you highlight something to me and I become that kind of conduit where I say, hey, he's highlighted something to me that needs to be looked at because we went back to about, we, we talked about not being able to say how we feel as men, not being able to reach out to anyone um, because of the feelings that we have or because we're going to be judged by our peers or whatever it is. And then we do an evaluation of you. We remove you from frontline duties and we assess you. Still in the role, but an assessment role where we can assess you. You know, that should take place, right? That should take precedence over everything. Because what does that lead to? It leads to the Met being less sued. The Met wouldn't be sued so much. There wouldn't be um, innocent people suing the Met. There wouldn't be Met police officers internally investigated by their own for something they've done through lack of training. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what the model is. You know, I don't know what it is. And I'm sure the Met have looked into it, but they need to shift into gear to get that moving. You know, they need to figure out something real quick. I don't know what their protocols are at the moment. Mm. It's a challenge with an organization like that compared to, I mean, you asked about the sort of military uh, preparedness for stuff. The reality is in the military, when we are not on an operation, we're training. Same with the mess. <laughs> yeah, well. But, yeah, I suppose, but then you, you, there's much more going on. So there's, there's always a constant demand for the Met, right? And there's, and there's a limited opportunity for downtime and then bring that training in. For sure. And I think the other thing we have in the Met is personal fitness and health. You know, let's be real. I've drove past police officers and thought, you would never catch me on your best day. Let's be real. You would never catch me on your, on your best day. And then we have to couple that with them carrying body armor, them carrying equipment, you know, all of that stuff. And if their only, only go-to in a stressful situation is their tactical options, not this, not this, you know, not... Uh, not sight or, sp or, or speaking to the people, not pre-knowledge of the person, not understanding where they are in the situation, what road are they on, what street are they on, where is their exit and entry points, none of that from a tactical perspective. They're a sitting duck. So when you get officers that overreact in certain situations, why do you think that is? You know, it's, it's, it's to do with a lot. It's a combustion pot ready to go. You know, it really is. It's, it's a deep... And I'm sure you have officers on who listen in and, and, and all the rest of it. They will, if they're honest, they will tell you what it is, you know. I'm out 10 years, close to 10 years. So things may have changed. I'm hoping things are better there now. I speak to people all the time. They're saying it's still the same. I'm glad you got out when you got out, all the rest of it. Um, but that whole thing, and we talked about it earlier, there, there's a narrative against the police, you know. Um, and, you know, I can remember there being a narrative against the, the military, military, but now, now more than ever, the police need to step up their game because I know of in the last two, three months, three officers that have taken their life. You know, I don't know them, but I know of that happening. Through Met through police? Uh, no, not, not all Met. Just yeah, just in general. And I'm sure there are a lot more that I don't know of. Um... And although I'm out, I still support, I still am an avid supporter of the Thin Blue, look at my, you'll see it, I'm an avid supporter of the Thin Blue Line, of military, of, of ambulance, of, of fire brigade, of all the services. Um, that, do they do an amazing job? Yes, they do, you know. Um, and it's easy to pick out the, the, the negative stuff from the outside looking in. But unless you're there, like I said, the stress in the Met is daily. It's minutely, it's second. You know, we don't know what's behind that door. You know, we don't know what we're going to. You can turn up to, you can go to a domestic at a house and arrive and suddenly you've got, you know, you, you've got a hostage situation. You know, you've got a, um, you've, got, you've got someone who wants to be killed by police. You don't know what you're turning up to. And that unknowing is, is more stressful than the knowing because you really have to use perceptional powers and, and understand what is going on there. And understand yourself. People don't don't take a lot into um, strengths and liabilities, which is massive. You know, I'm very self-analytical. 
you know, I'm very kind of aware of who I am and what I'm capable of. Uh, and I'm not superhuman, but I'm very aware of my strengths and my liabilities. When I'm out with my kids, they're a liability to me. That means I can't run anymore. That means if something happens, I have to have to deal with it. You know, have I injured my foot? Am I able to, to run? Can I climb over that if I, if, if I need to? And most cops don't think like that. They think about after it happens, you know, that, that's when their thought process comes in. Um, and there's, there's nothing in place for them. There should be people telling them, hey, man, you need to lose some weight here in the nicest possible way. When you join the Met, there should be something that says this is a high stressed role. You are going to be, you know, you're going to be dealing with everything and, every, and anything you can think of, you will deal with. Um, but yeah, mental and, health. Yeah, and most importantly, it's a thankless task. Absolutely thankless task. Um, and especially, especially at the moment, you know, it's, you only seem to hear, as you, I think you mentioned earlier, you only really hear about anything to do with the police when it goes, when it goes pear shaped, mm. when it's something bad or perceived to be bad. Especially a, a, a prime example. Um, Sarah Everard, bless her. Um, Met got slaughtered for it. The Met got now. Are you telling me every Met police officer a murderer? How crazy is that? And I feel that 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 ripple because I do support them, and I was there for nineteen years. I've been in that them them environments. Stranger abduction and murder is very rare, extremely rare. And I'm sure that will come out. You know, I'm sure in their findings and in the court case, it will come out. As horrendous as it is, it will come out. Whatever it is, will will show. You know, it will wash out. Um, but that's not every person in the Met. That's an individual that has brought the service into disrepute. And we can see that in anywhere. People forget police officers, or the Met as we call them. We're not. We're not kind of gods. We're not, you know, beings from another planet. We're not superhuman. We are regular people doing a irregular job, you know, and we're going back to our regular life every day, you know. So people forget that because of the uniform. People forget it's not the, the police that make the laws. We don't even enforce them because we were never there to enforce. We're there to uphold the rule of law. And there's a difference. You know, the Met, Met have changed their name from Met Police Force to Met Police Service. We're now ser at service to people. And we always were. We were civil servants. We are always at service to people. When I wore that uniform, my job was to serve my community and, and make the community safer, you know. And, and the slogan back then was working together for a safer London. Right? So it's crazy. And, and what people don't realize is Apart from the public attack in the Met on the lowest level, there are internal officers looking for a way to climb the ladder and stepping on officers from below. There's a reason why the Met have um, the internal investigations teams that work in every borough. There's a reason for that, you know. Um, they show up, um, police station becomes scarce, not because anyone's guilty of anything, just because... You know, it's like, fuck, if they want to find something, we can all find something, you know. Uh, we can all find something on someone, you know, whether you put the pen, wrote something in the book the wrong way. Um, and it's a very difficult task when you're being attacked from the inside as well as the outside. You know, so the stresses aren't just the job itself. It's the whole thing that is stressful. And anyone who's in there, I'll take my hat off to you. If you're in there now, you know, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's horrendous. It's crazy. Uh, walking, walking a knife edge every time, right? All the time. And uh, and I think he, as terrible it was with uh, Sarah Everard uh, thing. I, I don't think there would have been that reaction from people if it, if this had happened last year, or the year before. Mm. The police, and in fact, any authority at the moment are a target for certain parts of society. Yep. Um, in fact, a lot of society at the moment just because of just because of the dynamics that the pandemic's thrown up, the dynamics that Brexit's thrown up, the dynamics that even stuff going on in the USA is thrown up that's impacting yep, over here. Definitely. And and if and if people want to find wrongdoing, they will find it wherever they want to find it. And the problem is because of the pressure, 
it, regardless of whether, for example, a video of something taken to the smartphone is a two second clip of a 30 second video that's taken completely out of context. Absolutely. Because of the pressures, you get the authorities will act completely irrationally in coming down on the wrong person or the wrong, the wrong team department when they shouldn't be doing anything at all because nothing was done wrong in the first place. If you think about what you just said, that kind of sums it up. You can't get a glimpse of something. A prime example is when I used to work um, on the area cars, I don't know you, I've never met you, but you're driving a car which is known to us. Your plate flashes up on an AMPR, an automatic number plate reader. That goes back to our, our CAD office or wherever it goes, Scotland Yard. They then transmit that to the borough. The borough then send a CAD to our car that we've just passed to say that vehicle, blue vehicle, whatever it is, index, da 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 da, is known to be a, fire, a gunship, carry firearms, or sell drugs. What are we meant to do? What does the public pay us to do? Stop and, you know, our, our job is detour, detect, and bring those who commit crimes to justice. We don't have that sentences. We're the first barrier of defense. So we turn the car around, fly up behind the car, and I never put the lights on straight away. Turn the car around, I casually drive up behind them. Why do I do that? Well, I don't want to spook them. I don't want them to go taking off and we got a car chase. That's what I don't want, okay? Because I don't know who's in it. The other thing I don't want them to do is open fire on me or, or any members of the public. So we come up behind them, and I do another PNC on that vehicle to make sure it's the same vehicle because I don't trust the systems that be. I don't trust anything that is not manually operated. And even there's human error there. I would trust that I have someone to go back to and go, you told me this, not, oh, it came from Scotland Yard PNC straight in there. We don't put that information into the PNC. It gets added by the Borough Intelligence Unit or whoever put it on there. So we come up behind the vehicle. It's known. Okay, so we're going to stop this vehicle now. We follow the vehicle. What else do I notice about the vehicle? It has tints on the vehicle all the way around. So I don't know who's driving it. I don't know if they're black, if they're white, if it's a ma male or female. I don't know who it is. I stop the vehicle. The vehicle comes to a stop. We get out of the vehicle. We exit our vehicle and we go to the vehicle of the car. I still can't see who or what is in that vehicle because it's limo tinted sideways down. Okay, so I don't know who's in it. I know who should own that vehicle and where it should be. The window winds down and there's a person in there completely hostile to me. With the information I've just told you, how would you deal with that person? Uh, I, uh, I, wouldn't, I would be suspicious. Would you, would you be consciously worried about your personal safety? Yeah. You would. Would you be really polite to that person and say, would you mind coming out of it? If they're proper hostile to you, really hostile. Remember, you don't know how many, what's in the car. Verbally hostile, I take it. Saying. Not, yeah, verbally hostile, yeah. yeah. Verbally aggressive. Yeah, yeah. Now, remember, aggression varies on person to person. Some people talk very loudly. So I'm very, you know, monotone when I speak, very quiet about everything. But some, but some people are hugely aggressive. Ah, to me, that's an indication of something. Now, I don't know if they've been stopped previously by many police officers, but I need to check that vehicle. I then check him for his details or her, and I find out that that person doesn't own the vehicle. They don't have insurance or a driving license. There's no drugs or firearms in the car. It's a poor vehicle, and that's what it is. Bring them out of the vehicle. I'm then... I am then criticized by members of the public who film that from what they've seen, not the whole situation, because they don't know what I know, and my information isn't from me, it's come from PNC. So on stopping that, there's no driving license and no insurance. And then I say to this guy, not that I ever would, don't worry about it, mate, it's fine, off you go, have a safe journey home. On his way home, he knocks over and kills, God forbid, someone's wife and child on a zebra crossing. Would I then be criticized for that as well? That, in a nutshell, is what we get caught out with. Duty bound, what we've signed up to do as a job, and then what we decide to do during that, that interaction with that person. Now, I'm not saying if the person's violent and if he's aggressive verbally to me. You know, at the end of the day, what, what people have to do is understand that regardless of, of who you are, there are laws in the country, and you have to conform with those laws. 
You have to. There's no doubt. That's why there's police officers there. That's why there are laws in place. People don't want to hear that these days. What they want to place blame on is color or race, sexual orientation, whatever it is, and blame that for a stop rather than hard facts. Whatever happens during that interaction, once you know they're out the car or that interaction with them, definitely had the officer has part to play with it. But I don't know anyone in the face of adversity or in the face of violence would be like, oh, calm down, sir. Yeah, come out the car. No. People are not rational at that point. You know, their reptilian brain has kicked in. And what they're portraying now is a problem. And that problem can escalate very quickly. So our job is to negate that problem, get them to a place of safety. Once everything's safe, then we can deal with everything. Until that point, you're a hostile threat to me. And we'll be dealt with it in accordance to information received and what I see, a run-in risk assessment. I don't know if that makes sense to you. But to me, after 19 years, that's the one thing that kept me safe. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Uh, the problem is the problem is these days in in uh, I said these days again, we we'll say over the last year is that these the, the people, who, the smartphone people who will see a skin color and that is a trigger for them to of start course. recording. Of course, they in as much as they say, uh, as much as they portray their intent to be. Well, they don't portray their intent to be anything. But it's under the guise of we need more equality, whatever, whatever. It's not just skin colour. There's all sorts of different yeah, things. Yeah, of course. Right? But nice. the reality is that the way things have been dealt with the last year, it makes the authority, it makes police's job harder to treat people fairly. It, it's a reality, and it also it makes it puts more focus. It puts more focus on skin colour. It's as in that example, it's made it more. Uh, what's the word? You're more, the, the, the you're, offense, you're more conscious of it. Right. The offense gets pushed to the side. And what you get now is all police are racist. Yeah. That's what you get. Not, oh, let's take those factors into account. I've lived it. I've been there, seen it and done that. That is an actual incident I've dealt with. I've been there, seen it and done that on numerous occasions. What's the way back there, Eddie? Because one of the, one of the aggravating factors is the way, the way, the, how, uh, outrage is good for, is what media want. So we're going to, the media, you're talking about everyone's hounding the police. Since that, uh, since that uh, that murder was reported, and and then the vigil, right? I've seen it daily. I won't name mm -hmm. the article because I've been going on some flipping mainstream media rants lately. Just breaks me. <laughs> there's a there's a there's an outlet, and, and they're online on the website every single day. I've seen an article and it is highlighting something to do with the Met Police in a bad way. Of course. An officer has been caught doing it. All, there, all normal run of the middle stuff. There, like is, you said, humans, there is definitely a narrative out there. You know, as much as people saying there's a narrative against a minority group, there's a narrative against this person or that. There is a narrative that's being pushed right now against the Met. There definitely is. Now, if you go across the board of the whole country, you know, across the whole metropolis you know all the way through to scotland wales the headloo wherever these guys are greater manchester police we all have issues that we're dealing with you know, remember i'm not there anymore i'm just saying when i was there when i was there there was a saying it said if you point a gun at a metropolitan police officer twenty-six thousand other officers will be there to back him or her up if you point the finger at him he stands alone never was the truer case now than it was then. Expand on that. If you present a gun at me, 26,000 other officers will back me up. Yeah. If you point the finger at me and say, he's done this or he's done that, no one will stand with you. Not one. Why is that? Because of the stigma attached to all police are like this or all police are that. Now, it's easy for me, and I'm a lighter shade of brown, it's easy for me to say, oh, this person was racist to me. And, and what do people go? Oh, he was racist. Oh, that's outrage. Victim, victim mentality. I love it. Yeah, I loathe in that. Where I actually, like I said in the beginning of the, the podcast, I step out of that and go, hold on. He said that to me because I was being a dick. Because <laughs> I was being an arsehole. That's why he said that. He hasn't said it anything else. But to make my insecurities feel good, to make me feel better, to give my ego some life and, and whatever, I'm going to get the rally of the crowd. I'm gonna, and I'm not saying all cases are like that. I'm not saying there aren't any bad cops in the police. 
there are. I'm not saying there are. And racism exists. And it does it, exist. It passes society 100%. Yeah. But there is much more to this agenda than people are actually seeing, you know. Um, have you noticed the... I'm going to get you on your um, soapbox now, Hugh. Have you noticed the kill, kill the bill um, protest? What bill are we talking about here? This is the bill where people are protesting it because it thinks uh, that protesting is getting banned. However, it's just bringing in some limitations in certain circumstances like end finish times, for example. So it's not banning protesting. The bill is to bring in some, some extra constraints so that... Yeah, to, to control process, but not but, to ban them, right? But what bill are we talking about? Are we talking about that bill, or are we talking about the old bill? <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. Because it seems that that has been hijacked by people that want to attack the police. Those placards have killed the bill. The police are known as the old bill, right? Whenever I see people in scuffles with the police on those, those marches, they're not the people that are there for peaceful marching. I've done my own research on that. Have a look at the faces and who they are. They're on every march, not just the Kill the Bill march. They're in the BLM marches. They're in the um, they're in the um, G20 summit marches. You know, these people are prolific people that just want nothing more than to attack the narrative that that is going on with those Kill the Bill people. You know, it's totally changed. Look at the narrative that's been spat. Um, we should start attacking the police attack the police you know the increase in attacks on police has been massive everyone the police stops now they're stopping them for a reason you know i had a friend who i spoke to recently said look stop this group of guys scootering on the pavement as mundane as it was they said oh you stopped us because we're we're we, you know we're this or we're that no no i stopped you because you're scooting on the pavement you might injure another person you know let's deal with the hard facts and let's not deal with anything else but now the police are retract you know they're retreating and they're hesitant to stop people they're hesitant to get involved because someone will point the finger and go he said this to me or he done that um how do we, how do we pull it back how do we get it back to us i'm gonna ask you the same question i have no idea we're in such a society now mate where i think do you see how many genders that have come out recently yeah <laughs> do you get what i'm saying yeah like where does it stop like next thing it will be rights for green beans you can't cook them in a certain way because you'll offend them or you'll hurt them. Green beans that are grown in a garden. You know, there's so many. We've come so far turning back. I don't know if it's an option. You know, I just think I think the police have to man up and deal with what they have to deal with, which is crime and disorder. You know, that's what they have to deal with. And they have to deal with it as crime and disorder. You know, you've got that's what I'm saying to you. You've got to take that on the chin. I think they let themselves down where they they don't re release the the um the cam footage straight away that is massive you know that is massive release that information if you've done nothing wrong in the police you know the body cam footage put it out straight away don't let people draw an inference from it when i was in the the mark duggan riots you know the family didn't receive any information for two days that's what triggered the riots you know that's why we were deployed over there. that's that's what happened had someone come out and spoken to them. Now, I heard that someone did, but they didn't want that answer. They wanted another answer. Well, we can't give you that answer because an inquiry has to happen. It has to go to the IPCC, uh, the Independent Police, uh, Police Co Complaints Authority, or whatever it's called now. Um, but people want their answer. They don't want the answer. And that's a big thing, you know. It goes back to that victim mentality and the accountabilities. But... The thing is, I, 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 I understand that uh, they need to take things back, so the police need to you know, just get back on top of things. But without top, top cover, without top level support, when there's going to be a knee jerk reaction to a bit of footage or, or the fact there was a protest to follow up, there was an incident, the police have to be seen to doing something to suspend someone, for example, or wh whatever it is, it, that shouldn't. Shouldn't be the case. It should be like it was back in the old, you know, back back in the old days. Back the lantern, two man. years ago, mate, a year and a half ago, you know, when it wasn't like this. It wasn't like this. But then that's not just I mean, we're focused on the Met. That's a, a that we need to man, pull sort of. You, you know, the, we're putting the world to peace right now, don't you? This is our perfect world in this perfect little bubble here, and in this recording studio, we're just kind of <laughs> laying it out real simple for people because that's what what should be done. 
we're not politicians. We're not bureau, you know, we're not bureaucrats. We're talking about the frontline officers and what they deal to deal with day to day, and how that affects their mental health because that's quite prominent when someone's called a racist in the Met. Because when you say that to them, or that a complaint comes in about them, what do you think all the other Met guys do and girls? What do you think they do? They go, Fuck it, I'm not going to go near him. I don't want that to be attached to me. You know, I don't want that to happen to me. So he's then alone, or she's then alone. You know, that goes back. They go home. The press miraculously have a way of releasing people's addresses. People show up at the house, and they're hounded. And then from something they weren't, or something that was taken out of proportion or whatever, they suddenly are this monster and this and that. And the guy put his um, recyclable rubbish in his brown bin, not his green bin or whatever way around it goes, and now he's the worst criminal in the world. Come on, do me a favour. You've got a guy that's been in the job 10, 15, 20 years, laying his life on the line every single day, doesn't know if he's going to go home that night, and you're worried about him putting his rubbish in the wrong bin, do me a favour, you know, that's, it's crazy. It's right. crazy. So Caroline Flack's happened. What yeah. happened there? I don't know what that is. Caroline Flack, uh, she was the, she was a TV presenter and um, some stuff went on in her personal life and it went bigger than Ben-Hur on, on social media and on the news, got taken to the cleaners and then she topped herself not long ago, a few, wow, three wow. years ago. Yeah, three wow. years ago. Maybe I do remember Hideous that mate. story. Maybe I do remember that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I do. So, yeah. Yeah, horrendous. And it's, that's how things like that happen. Um, unnecessarily pressure brought on. In, exposures into people's private lives where, you, again, you get, a, you get a piece of the whole picture without context and there's assumptions made. And then the, and then the media have got a headline. They've got a headline about the Met Police. They've got a headline about a, a TV presenter. They've got a headline about this, that, or that person. Because it sells. Before, it, because it sells. It's, it's, it's absolutely it's disgusting. It of course it is. Um, and I think the, the media the media is a big part of it. I think it should be policed better. Um, well, on the way here, I heard that they brought in guidelines recently, maybe today even, about Ofcom and what when they're interviewing people, what they can and can't, or what duty of care they have over their mental well-being. Absolutely right. You know, absolutely right. It should be. That's part of it. I mean, that's that's part of it. Of course. But then sh there should be more. There should be heavier fines for them. So if mm -hmm. the, if the media are deliberately po if they they've posted something they haven't done due diligence on, right? Because that's the thing at the moment. It's too easy for them to do that. Yeah. I saw an article two days ago, and it was referencing, it was quoting someone, and it named this, it named the person, uh, named the first name of this person, is quoting them. And I read through it, and I'm trying to think, cause they're pretty, da and it was about the police, they're pretty damning, that's pretty damning comments there, someone said, about this incident that went on. Mm. And I read through it again, they didn't give the surname of the person, and the quotes came from Facebook. They got this publicly off of Facebook. That person is no one. It's yeah, no one. It's course, not. It's not course. anyone of authority, and it. it um, and I didn't realize they could just do that until that, it happened. It happened to me yeah. a few years ago. In a, I say in a positive way. Someone got killed, and I put a, I put a, you know, a, a message on Facebook. It was three, four years ago. I put a message on Facebook about this this person, like you know, daddy gone, blah 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 blah, and that was taken and put into the newspapers as a, as if I had given a quote to him about this person. Yeah, it fucking broke me. No. It, it annoyed yeah. me that it did it um, because it made me out to be someone looking for attention, and as if I'd gone, oh, I'll give you a quote about it. Wasn't the yeah, case, yeah, yeah. but if they're willing to take some random line off of Facebook as a random flipping man or woman and put it in as a quote, people read that and think that's the actual that the, what what in general what people are thinking about whatever incident went on. It, put, it makes it out to be worse than what it is. Mm. And what's the punishment for something like that? I mean, well, there's no punishment for that because they can do it, right? But let's say they publish an article or a line or a story or, or they, po they post a partial fact, okay, which is has hideous repercussions. And then they get told by Ofcom or whatever the regulator is or whatever media it is, they get told off for it. And then they get told normally it's take the take the article down, retract the information, issue, issue an apology. Maybe there's a small fine. But it's not. That's not a big enough fine. They still benefited from the fucking so. clickbait they've created. Mm -hmm. They still benefited from all the attention they got. There's still people being impacted by article going out, and it's not. The financial fines aren't big enough. Prime example of this, right? There is a. There's a vaccine. But I'm not even going to say this. I'm not even going to say the c word, right? BBC published a headline the other day, and it said seven. This is the headline. Okay. Again, it goes back to that division that the media are doing. Seven people die 
uh, seven people have died in the UK of blood clots after receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine. I read it and went, head, that's the headline. Okay, and I read the rest of the article. Also contained in the article is in total 30 people got blood clots. Okay, but the total amount of people who received the vaccine is 18 million. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. 18 million. <laughs> and they put the headline, seven people die from blood clots. It's only one reason, one reason they made that the headline. Because that's not the fact. The fact is 0.0000007% of people are likely to die from a blood clot, if it's even the fucking cause of the blood clot. Mm-hmm. How many people died just out of anything after getting yeah, that? Of course. Right? There's only one reason they put that as a headline. Outrage, divisiveness, completely misleading people, completely misleading people who don't look below the surface of whatever they're reading or being exposed mm-hmm. to. And that's part of the issue. We've got this thing going on with the police, not just Met Police, as you said, it's against In all general, police, yeah. against authority. People seeing outrageous headlines, seeing outrageous thing, or perceived hideous incident because someone got stopped or arrested or whatever because of mm. whatever demogra- demographic they are, so it's perceived to be um, uh, not as equal as anyone else. And uh, they don't scratch below the surface. The next thing you've got the protests going on, you've got riots going on, you've got statues getting toppled, you've got people kicking off for no reason, destroying destroying lives, destroying businesses. Just, oh. I told you I'd get you on your soapbox, and mate. Well, it, 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 <laughs> we, we need to have, we need to have, the country needs to be led by good role models, okay? There is no role models who are completely authoritarian. That is people who are just normal, decent people. Normal, decent people that go by normal, good values and standards. Agreed. Okay, and that is it. You have to lead by example. Agreed. And it's not being done at the moment. I'm, I'm going to say people, I mean organisations, who have got the attention of the general populace. That's from politicians to news outlets to flipping sports stars, singers. The, the problem you've got with that is people are choosing sides. And, and, you know, some, listen, I always say, as you've touched on the, the Black Lives Matter thing, if you weren't screaming and marching and being on that front line 10 years ago, don't tell me you've just become a fan now and you've come out of the woodwork now because you're empowered, because you've seen a group of people, you know, doing that and you feel it's right because, you know, we witnessed the murder with George Floyd. We definitely did. There was definitely... You know, we're all accountable for that in some way, shape, or form. And by that, I mean anyone who was there. If I was there, and I'm no hero, if I was there, I would have done more than just speak to that officer. You know, if you really felt that strongly, white, black, Chinese, Korean, whoever you are, you know, that's where the onus comes in. You know, and and I think that if you wasn't screaming this stuff 10 years ago, why are you on the march now? If you're not still marching today for that, you know, don't jump on the bandwagon. Because these celebrities, and there are a few of them, and that infuriates me, that are jumping on this bandwagon of, yeah, police this and police that, or, you know, equality and this and that, because of um, it's the right time for them to do so. It fits their agenda because it elevates their, or it maintains their celebrity status, if you like. Um, while all of that was going on, um, a 20-year case had been solved. Michael Barrymore murder. You see that? It got solved. It's been solved. I knew there was a new, there's right. like a new lead. Go on. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying. And there's lo- That's a minuscule thing. Using a bloody Michael Barrymore thing. But I'm just saying what was pushed underneath all of that, those agendas, while that was going on. There's so much else that had, that happened, but it'd been drowned out because the narrative that was being pushed by the press, by the media, by those people in, in that sort of thing was, let's turn the whole thing of this COVID thing into a you know, race thing, let's turn it into a attack the police thing. And people don't realize what's actually going on. I don't realize what it is, but I know there's something bigger at play here. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist like that, but I'm just saying that it, it just doesn't make sense. You know, it just does not make sense that it's taken celebrities so long to come out and talk about this. Right? Because if you have a following on Instagram, you could rally a few thousand people to go out and march. Right? Before all this, I'm sure racism didn't just happen with George Floyd. It's been going on forever and ever and ever. That narrative. You know, need it. And and I just think that yeah, that ignited it. But if you weren't out like I've got friends that that were like, Why are you not coming on the march? Why are you not taking a knee? You know, this and that. Listen, I have my own agenda. Okay, you're on yours, and I understand what you're trying to achieve, 
but I don't think what you're doing is achieving that. I really don't think that's achieving what you want it to be because I've asked many different supporters of BLM and I'm not bashing them. I think, hey, if you're going to do your thing, do your thing. I'll support your, your right to protest. But none of them have the same agenda. They're all different agendas. I've spoken to many people from it. Some want equality, you know, some want equal rights, some want, um, it was, I heard a f the funniest one was that they introduced the rights for transgender people into that. I, I don't know what that has to do with their, their, um, into BLM. Yeah. Right. You know, I don't know how, unless they're, they're black transgender people, you know, but when you say, say black, I'm a shade of that. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I got, I've kept the message on my Instagram. I put up a picture of George Floyd and just to say that anyone who, who's taken their oath to be a police officer, what we witnessed was a murder here. Anyone who's taken their oath and doesn't stand up to this is not worth their, their badge. And I got a message directly from someone who runs the Black Lives Matter. I've kept it on my phone and asked me to remove the post because it drowned out the message. Well, I don't know. It's crazy. It's... I mean, this, you know, it's, and then you go, because you're not, because, because you are BAME community, right? But you're not part of that. Then you become the enemy. You, you, I'm, I'm an enemy anyway. Yeah, I'm I, an enemy anyway, because, but... because I back the blue. Ah, uh, yeah. You forget that, right? I'm Uncle Tom. Do you know, do you know him? No. No, me neither. But that's apparently. <laughs> <laughs> that's... Uncle Tom. Uh, who the hell is that guy? The amount of messages I had in hate mail. And I FaceTime them all. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Listen, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not. I'm not bad ass like that. But if you're gonna threaten me on on Instagram and that and all the rest, well, I'm gonna FaceTime you. I'm gonna see see who you are. You know. And and if I have to, I'll show up and we'll have a conversation. It's that simple. You know. Um, but don't do that. You know, because you don't know. You don't know my story. You know. You don't know that I'd spent 20 years defending your rights that when when it gets bad that you pick up the phone and dial 999 and I'll come regardless of your colour or who you are or your sexual orientation and I will help you with your problem yeah but that doesn't matter because you're not allowed to have opposing views Eddie you've, I got to, you've got to fall in line with everyone I agree you're not allowed no nope. you can't have opposing views no. nope. everyone has to think exactly the same no nope. <laughs> no nope. yeah, and and you know you probably know this some people really feel offended when you wear a poppy um on your on your uniform or on your police uniform. I've not experienced it yet. Oh no, I have. You know, we've seen that. Um, hey, sue me. If you feel so strongly, sue me. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. You start wrapping it up. We went right down the rabbit, rabbit hole, hole of, of n n nothing to do with <laughs> the book. <laughs> hey, that's the message. Yeah. It's not the yeah. book. It's the message, you know, it, it really is the message. I mean, and the message is always and will always be the same. You know, I have a firm, firm belief in, you know, I love your podcast. I love what you do um, from the limited stuff I've seen. I think they're very deep and very um, thought provoking. You've not listened to all 128? No, not yet. Jesus Christ, Jeez. Daddy. Hugh, you know, I don't even have 128. It's like me sitting here, my toes are itching to get moving. <laughs> um, the... The big thing for me is 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 the message, you know, and and I think positive sort of messaging is what the world needs. That lighthouse, and, and you are a lighthouse, whether you think about, you know, whether you think that or not. Um, you know, I know I am from the people that are around me, and I know I know you are, which is why I'm here, and I know many other people that I interact with are, um, and I appreciate you having me on. Mate. It's a, it's an absolute honour to have met you anyway, because I know who you are, I know about you. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, a guy who served in the Met and, and gave up some time to assist the people of my community in my country. And uh, I'm very proud to have done that. It just didn't work out for me with the powers that be. Um, and my journey and timeline wasn't in sync with, with what it was. And I'm, but I'm right where I, uh, I should be. I'm right where I need to be right now. Right, that's the main thing. That's Absolutely. it. Be where you want to be, right? And Absolutely. if you can articulate a message well, which you do, then just fucking articulate yeah. it. Yeah. And if people want to listen, they will do. And if they don't want to... Well, Turn they can, off. They can bugger off. Turn off. <laughs> Avoid me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure. Ah, hang on. How do people get hold of you? So Twitter, oh, Instagram. Come on. Yeah. Uh, can you remember them? Just about. They're all the same. 
at ekbjj. That's it. Very simple. And a website? Uh, ekbjj.com. It is simple, isn't it? Very simple. Yeah. My whole life's simple now. So nothing complex here. Mate, good luck with the book. Appreciate it, man. And life. And I'll, uh, I'll have to dig the gear out and get back, get into the gym. And come get, visit get us. Turn in, You've got to come visit us. Gratuitous violence and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, dude. Appreciate it, man. Thank you.